Okay, I press the record. Okay, we can start. Go on. Okay, so we're good. Just, we're live. Uh, yeah. Okay, just wait for the people to join. <laughs> it's just the two of us right now, right? <laughs> no, wait. Yeah, Mon Monday we actually only had about a, I think six people show up. It was a little disappointing. So hopefully uh, a few more will show up today. Yeah, let's see. Maybe it's a technical problem. Some, um, we have a few people, at least two. <laughs> okay, okay. Okay, let me start. Welcome everyone to the 2020 APAC Ground Brokers virtual tour by APAC OUC. This year, our event would be the biggest one ever done with 174 sessions, including normal sessions, workshops, and hands-on labs. From 123 different speakers over 11 days. Also, it would cover sessions on four different languages. Please remember to register to as many sessions you can, and all sessions would be available to replay as many times you want for two weeks after the initial session date and time. You can also interact with the speaker at any time during uh, that two weeks by posting questions or comments directly in the playback session page. Uh, I would like to say thanks to all Oracle user groups and Java user groups that made this event possible. And also to our sponsors, Oracle Groundbreakers and CloudDB. And finally, for today, introduction to Graal VM by David Buck. Please feel free to write questions at any time during the session at the Q&A tab of the Zoom. And the speaker would be answering them at the end of the session. If any issues during the presentation, please feel free to contact me at any time on the chat tab of the Zoom webinar. OK. And. Now, without any more delays, I would like to leave you with this amazing session by David Buck. Okay, okay, David, up to you. Great, hi. So um, let me just uh, share my screen here. Okay, so can everyone see my slide? Yeah, it's okay. Good. Okay, great. So we'll go ahead and kick things off. So hi there. Um, I've got about 40 some minutes to talk to you guys about GraalVM. It's a really exciting topic. There's a whole lot to cover and I can I'm only kind of scratch the surface um, in such a short amount of time, but I'm going to do my best to kind of show you as much cool things about, about this technology as possible in the very short amount of time we have. Um, so the safe harbor statement, um, pretty standard for Oracle presentations. I'm sure you've all, all seen it before. Um, just a really quick self-introduction. So my day job, my bread and butter work is um, I'm a JVM sustaining engineer, which means I basically find and fix bugs in the hotspot, um, the, the JDK hotspot source code. Um, I've also uh, been a maintainer for the updates project for OpenJDK. Um, I've spoken at Java One um, a, about a dozen times, maybe more. I, really remember. Um, I co-authored um, Japan's most popular Oracle WebLogic uh, book, which I think we're the only WebLogic book, so maybe that's not too much to brag about, but <laughs> um, it's out there. Um, I, I do Twitter and um, I blog occasionally. 
And I also am a huge fan of, of Taco Bell for those of you who know what that is. So um, just to get one thing out there, um, I'm not a member of the Growl VM team at, at Oracle. I work in the on the Java in the Java platform group um, on the Hotspot VM. Um, but these two technologies, as we'll see and as we'll cover in our upcoming slides, are very interrelated. And so um, we work very closely together with the Growl VM team, and, and sometimes we we troubleshoot uh, user issues together. Uh, you know, we send pull requests to each other's code and stuff. So, so um, out of sheer necessity, we're, we're all very familiar and, and big fans of, of each other's technology. So this talk in particular, um, what kind of motivated, motivated me to do this is two reasons. One is that um, there still seems to just be a whole lot of, of confusion out there as to what GraalVM actually is and what you can do with it. So today's talk, I'm not going to go into any excruciating detail about anything. Um, the, the goal is not so much to teach you how to use it, but why you would want to use it and, and try and motivate you to go out and, and try it, and give it a shot and see what it can do for, for your application. So um, we're, we're going to, this is more of a basic introduction. We're just going to kind of cover what GraalVM is and what it can do. And I'll leave the details as a homework assignment for anybody who's, who's interested in what they see today. As you can see, there, there's a lot going on here. Um, the idea is that um, Growl VM is kind of this universal VM as opposed to a JVM um, that allows you to execute all these different languages in a very high performance way. And then you can even, as opposed to just standalone use cases, you can perhaps even embed it in, in platforms and, and within frameworks that you're already using today and are familiar with, like, for example, Node.js. Um, so the Grail VM can work as kind of a drop-in replacement um, as your, your execution engine in, in a lot of scenarios, which makes it very easy to, to migrate to and, and very uh, powerful and flexible to use. But we'll, we'll cover all this in detail in upcoming slides. But before we get too deep, um, just to make sure everybody's on the same page, I want to just uh, define a few terms just to make sure that, that um, everybody is, is with us. So, um, pretty much everyone in the Java community is very familiar with just-in-time compilation. And, you know, it's something we've been doing in Hotspot since uh, you know, JVK 1.3. And of course, it's not a technology unique to Java. So I think we're all pretty much familiar with this. But just to, to be pedantic here, the, the gist is, is that um, you know, during your build time, you know, we're using Java C and you're converting the, the Java source code into Java byte code. Um, that's separate from the runtime. And in JIT compilation, what we're doing is, is we're actually during runtime, um, compiling that Java byte code to the machine code of, of the native platform that we're running on top of. And that gives us um, you know, near native, native performance or sometimes even better performance than, than what you'd get from a static compilation like with, with a C compiler. And then a term that's probably a little less familiar to a lot of people, at least in the Java community, is ahead of time compilation. And the reason this term is unfamiliar is it kind of exists as a counterpoint to just-in-time compilation. So AOT, in a way, is, is kind of you know the, the standard static compilation that we are all familiar with. If you just have like GCC or, or something and you statically compile your C code into native code, um, that is also, in a sense, AOT. So the distinction here is that um, we're actually dropping the, the Java bytecode down into machine code um, during build time or at some point before runtime or before deployment. And that saves us the overhead of, of trying to do that compilation at the same time that we're actually running code. So why is there so much confusion about GraalVM? Why, why do people have a hard time? And you, know, you hear all these answers when you ask people what GraalVM is and what you can do with it. Um, and generally, they, they tend to give you answers that are about like one third correct, you know, because they know one, one particular use case, but they don't know the others. And, and so one of the goals of today's talk is to cover all the different major use cases and, and how they fit together. Um, so in one sense, it is an AOT technology. Um, and, and some people might be confused because, you know, well, Oracle JDK or, or Open JDK also has um, AOT functionality built into it. In fact, the AOT functionality in 
on the regular hotspot JDK is also in, in a way based on the Growl technology. And so it's really important to kind of understand what is the difference here and, and what, why is Growl VM different from the regular Open JDK, Oracle JDK builds that, that a lot of people already use. Um, another term that comes up is the substrate VM. So we're gonna talk a little bit about what the substrate VM is and what it can do for you and, and how that might be different that you, you can be using the Growl VM without using the substrate VM. Um, so that th those terms are not exactly synonymous. And so we'll get into all those nitty gritty details. So for example here, um, on the left side, we have the, the kind of plain vanilla, so to speak, Oracle JDK or Open JDK um, environment. And you can see as of JDK 9, when we introduced the ahead of time compilation functionality, um, we actually use the Growl compiler technology on that. So uh, the regular, Java JDK ships with um, the Growl compiler embedded in it since JDK 9. Um, the only, you know, kind of supported use case for that is AOT compilation, um, but but it's all in there. So in a sense, you know, Growl is already a part of Growl, a, a very valuable and, and important piece of the Growl technology is already embedded inside the JDK. And at the same time, Growl VM, of course, itself um, is, is a full working JDK. It, it has, you know, hotspot, it has all the class library. And so, you know, you don't really have a Growl VM without the, the JDK. So each of these two technologies actually incorporates the other half. Um, and, and so that's one of the sources of why people um, get confused as to, you know, what they're actually talking about and, and what includes what. So, you know, what is Growl VM? Is it an AOT compiler? Is it an JIT compiler? Is it a polyglot execution environment? It's actually all of these things. And so you can think of the use cases for um, Growl VM as kind of being covered by this Venn diagram. So, you know, we have basically, you know, to use Growl VM, it, you know, base, I'm going to assume you're using the Growl compiler. And the Growl compiler basically has two use cases or two to situations or, or ways that you can use it. You can use it as an AOT compiler, or you can use it as a JIT compiler. The JIT compiler, of course, gives you a use case that's very similar to the, the regular hotspot um, JIT compilation that, that we all know and love. Um, so, you know, you these two use cases are mutually exclusive and you're either doing one or the other. There's no way to kind of do them at the same time. But orthogonal to that is the polyglot functionality. Um, where you can run all these different languages in a very efficient way and, and swap data between between different language um, use cases. And that is something that you may be using on top of one of these um, two compilation scenarios, or you you might not be using at all and stuff. So you can kind of imagine four different use case scenarios, AOT, AOT with polyglot, or JIT, or JIT with polyglot. Um, so, and, and as we, we cover each of these use cases in detail, I think if there's any confusion here, that'll become more clear as we move forward. So that's enough background to kind of understand what the agenda is so we can lay out the right roadmap for the rest of our time together. So right now we're still in the middle of the overview. I've got a little more basic um, groundwork to lay before we jump into the individual topics, but we're breaking things down by use case from, from here on out. So we're gonna talk about the JET, we're gonna talk about the AOT ahead of time use case. And then finally, we're gonna wrap things up with the polyglot um, stuff. And then we'll leave you with some takeaways to, to wrap everything together. But first off, so when people talk about Growl or Growl VM, um, there's also even some confusion just about that because of the naming. Um, you know, for, for better or for worse, Growl VM um, is, is kind of a name that came along later in, in the development process to cover a number of very closely related you know, interdependent technologies that are, are still at least different though. Um, so we have the Truffle framework, which is our language runtime framework, which allows us to run kind of non uh, Java bytecode based languages on top of, of Growl VM. Um, we have the Growl compiler, which has, as I already mentioned, um, supports both AOT compilation and JIT compilation. And we have the substrate VM, um, which is part of the AOT compilation use case. And, and we'll go into detail about what that means um, later in the presentation. But all these different technologies all got wrapped up together and called Growl VM. And so when someone's talking about Growl, you should really, um, you know, 
be specific about, okay, so which technology are you talking about? Which use case are you talking about? And, and that can save you a lot of confusion at the end. So a lot of the goals here is, is to do things faster than we've done them before, is to improve performance. Um, and of course, there's lots of ways to measure performance, right? What is performance is not something that's easy to, to answer. So the most traditional answers have usually been around something like throughput or latency. That's certainly in the, in the Java platform group. That's something that we've traditionally been most focused on. And so throughput might be something like transaction number of transactions per unit time. Latency might be something like, you know, you're using a concurrent garbage collector to make sure that your response times are, are under um, you know, 10 milliseconds or something like that. So you, your, your response time would be the factor there. Um, so this is the standard stuff, but the reality is for performance, performance is whatever your boss thinks it is, right? And, and that answer is changing for a lot of us, especially over the past uh, five to 10 years as we've entered this, this new cloud world. So before with throughput and latency were the biggest focus of these kind of client server models where we had on-premise stuff. Um, now we're also seeing stuff where memory footprint is a huge factor. It's something that people pay way more attention to these days. And that's because it very often has a direct impact on their cloud usage bills for, for uh, infrastructure as a service. So people are looking to scale their applications across many multiple processes. And so for each process, the more that you can shrink that memory footprint, the more money you can save. So all of a sudden that's a very key performance measure where maybe 15 years ago, it wasn't so much on everyone's radar. Startup time is also um, something that has been impacted greatly by cloud adoption. Um, we're looking at usage cases like um, you know, functions as a service and, and serverless. And in cases where you, you have a process that might be fired up on demand in response to an incoming request, being able to, to warm up and, and start responding to that request as soon as possible is very, very critical. And where, pre where previous kind of enterprise usages of, of Java and similar technologies, we're not so focused on, on startup time. And finally, even deliverable size, you know, we're trying to get our, our Docker containers as small as humanly possible. And so anything that we can, can chip away at the, at the size of our deliverables is a win for us. So the way we scale our applications is changing. Um, we used to think in terms of, well, you know, there's a fixed cost to running the JVM. You know, it's kind of the, the off-heap memory that's used for things like compilation and, and whatnot. And we want to amortize that across as, and as many runtime threads as possible so that we can get the most bang for our buck. So we had these monolithic applications that were running in a single process, single address space with as many threads as possible. And now we're looking at kind of a, a more cloud-centric way of, of designing our applications where we scale across multiple processes. And so that way, if the chaos monkey or whatever comes and, and kills a particular process, we can just restart it. So these make these things easier to scale for things like microservices and whatnot, and also perhaps more, more redundant, more resilient in the face of, of the outages or of individual um, processes that might be running anywhere. So we're seeing more and more focus on, on the memory footprint, startup time and deliverable size. One other thing I want to mention right from the get-go is that there are two separate editions of GraalVM. Um, I'm going to focus very heavily on the community edition, which is open source. You know, it's free as in beer um, and, and as in free speech. Um, so you can go download it. It's all on GitHub. Um, and the, the web page that I'll keep pointing everyone to is, is GraalVM.org. And you can just go there and that will tell you, you know, that will take you to where you can download it. And you can start playing around with this for free without any contracts or licenses or anything scary like that. Um, and then we have um, Enterprise Edition, which is a commercial offering, and it's backed by Oracle's full support um, organization, and it gives you some, you know, above and beyond what you get in Community Edition in terms of performance and things like that. And we'll mention what a few of those are as, as we move through the slides. Um, but basically, you can think of it as, as what you get with Community Edition, but on steroids and, and with um, enterprise level support. So for, for enterprise users, that's going to be something. If you like what you see and experience with Community Edition, um, I would really recommend that you check out what is available in Enterprise Edition. So all of this is based around the Growl compiler, in, in, in a sense. So we have to kind of talk about what is the Growl compiler. And the Growl compiler is a JIT. You know, is, is a Java compiler, a compiler that, that takes as its input Java bytecode, generally speaking, and then gives you machine code in whatever target platform you're running on top of. Except unlike other com 
in compilers that compile Java bytecode, um, the Growl compiler is actually written in Java itself. So contrast this to hotspots C1 or C2 that are written in C++ or, or JRock, it's one that was just written in, in plain vanilla C. Um, you know, we've seen JIT compilers that are implemented in native languages on different platforms before, but having a, a JIT compiler that was written in Java is, is kind of interesting, right? So we actually have something that is, you know, it's a JIT compiler that ends up JITing itself as, as it's warming up, which, which is pretty interesting and, and seems almost contradictory. But when you think about it a little bit, it's actually not that odd. I mean, any static compiler technology, you know, like GCC is written in C, you know, like, like having a compiler be self-hosting is actually uh, very normal and, and par for the course uh, before we started talking about things like virtual machines and, and bytecode and stuff like that. Um, so um, ja the Growl compiler way of thinking is actually not that, that strange or different. So what does this buy us? What are the advantages of doing this in Java? And one is, well, you know, it's, it's just easier to develop and, and maintain. It's actually easier to read and understand. So if you're a Java developer and you're looking at the Growl source code, you know, in a few hours, you can kind of make sense of what you're seeing and, and you know, maybe even, you know, be fixing things or changing things or whatever. It's, it's much more accessible to people who are proficient in Java, whereas in um, C1 and especially C2 um, might be, um, somewhat more difficult to ramp up on, even if you are very skilled in, in C++. Um, it's, it's just a very um, expansive and complicated code base to, to get to know. Um, also, you know, I mean, Java in itself has, of course, obviously we believe is a fantastic language. And so by writing something in Java, you get the performance advantage of all the high performance runtimes that we've been, you know, we have centuries of engineer um, time invested in to, to increase the, the performance of. You have the portability of Java, you know, write once, run anywhere. Um, and also kind of somewhat overlooked advantage is that if we do our compilation, like our JIT compilation in Java, that means that we're using the same Java heap um, as the rest of the application is using. So after we warm up, memory that previously would have been part of our native footprint, but not necessarily available to our application in any real sense, um, is now actually just part of the Java heap and can be reused for, for kind of our, our work payload of what the application is actually trying to do. So that's the, that's the Growl compiler technology. And now we're gonna go into the individual use cases of, of what it actually does for us. So the first use case is using it as a JET. And this is basically, um, you know, the, the, this is the most obvious kind of use case for people that come from a Java background because it really is just a job drop in replacement for your current JDK. So you can take it and you can you know, just, just kind of point your Java home environmental variable or whatever to use the Growl distribution as opposed to the JDK distribution. And all of a sudden um, you're doing your um, compilation with Growl as opposed to, to C2. So what exactly I mean by this is that, um, you know, Hotspot has this modular design and we do this to try and keep the interfaces between the, the three major parts of the JVM as, as cleanly separated and as loosely coupled as possible. And so, um, you know, for GC, there, there are several GC algorithms that we have um, and that we might be using at the same time. And then we have several different JIT compiler, well, two different JIT compilers that we use traditionally before Growl came along. And then the runtime handles everything else like thread management and uh, you know, JNI and you know, everything. It's all the bookkeeping for the, the, the JVM and that really doesn't change. And we also of course have a bytecode interpreter that's part of the runtime. And, and that's what runs our, our Java bytecode before um, anything gets JIT compiled. So as you can see, we could take the DC and we can, we can use G1, or we can use you know concurrent mark and sweep or whatever, but we can independently change this one part of the JVM when we start up, and that gives us a lot of flexibility. On the JIT side, um, traditionally we've had two compilers in Hotspot. We've had C1, which is known as the, the client compiler, which is really quick and dirty. It gives you a really quick um, compilation, but the uh, the output code is not that highly optimized. And then there's the server compiler C2 that does spends much more resources and time on each compilation, but the output of that result, the result of that operation is, is much more optimized code that, that eventually will give you a faster peak performance. So um, you can, just like you can swap out different GC algorithms, you can swap 
out the different tick compilations. So, um, you know, traditionally what we've had um, by default from JDK 8 is something we call tiered compilation, where we try and get the best of both worlds. So instead of having C1 or C2, we actually have both. So your Java code might run through, uh, have a lifetime where it starts off interpreted, and then if it's marked as high, it's first compiled by C2, so we get something really quick um, that, that's way faster than interpreter, but still not very highly optimized yet. And then eventually we'll go back as kind of an optimization strategy and recompile it with C2 to give us the final result. This is somewhat something of an oversimplification, but that's basically what it looks like today. So by default from KDK 8 and later, um, we have both JIT compilers in, in use. So what's happened with Growl is we're actually just replacing C2 with the Growl compiler. So if you're looking at this and going, well, you know, how, how does it compile itself? It doesn't, you know, in the beginning, it can run in, as interpreted because again, the runtime has an interpreter. And then it's not just limited to that. It can also be C1 compiled before it gets around to compiling itself. Um, so the, what, what might seem kind of like almost like a paradox or something here um, actually isn't that weird or, or strange. It's the fact that we actually run Java code, Java byte code in, in different phases, so to speak, and we can use the previous phases, the you know the interpreter to bootstrap um, the later stuff, and so Growl um, really doesn't have any problems. So we're still using tiered compilation. Your code still starts off interpreted. It still gets compiled by C1 originally for the first shot at JIT, but then during the really optimized, you know, kind of server-oriented work that we do, um, Growl comes in to give us the most, the highest performing code. What this actually gives us is, in some cases, something hopefully um, you know, significantly better optimized than what C2 would, would give you. Um, so this is from a, um, a collection of, of benchmark tools known as uh, renaissance.dev. And you can go to renaissance.dev. Um, I have a link at the end of the slide deck. And you can see here, and you know, if, if you're going to go in and cherry pick certain results, um, you know, for example, the, the naive Bayes one, we see a huge performance even just for community edition, um, you know, several times the performance of, of what we're seeing with just the regular C2 compilation. And there's another one, the, this, this Scala, this particular Scala benchmark here where we can see, um, I'm sorry, the, the, uh, the Caymans, I think it's pronounced one over here, we can see just a huge improvement even with, with community edition. So the point of this though really is that the, any, the performance improvement that you will see by adopting Growl as a JIT compiler is very dependent on your workload. And so the best thing to do is download it, give it a try. Um, even Enterprise Edition, I believe there's, there's an OTN license available. So it, it's free to just try out in your development environment um, for evaluation purposes only. So there's no harm in just kind of, you know, use it as a drop-in replacement for your JDK and run it and see if you get better performance. Because we've seen a lot of users that, you know, that's all they do. They don't have to do any other work to migrate or anything like that. And just out of the box, they see uh, significantly better performance if they're lucky enough that their workload kind of, you know, jibes with, with the Growl um, compiler. And as I mentioned earlier, one of the other um, advantages to doing your, your JIT compilation here is that basically, you know, a certain amount of what we call off-heap memory, it's, it's the non-Java heap memory that's consumed by the JVM runtime. A lot of that is actually consumed by the C2 compiler because it just does so much work to try and optimize the code so heavily. That requires a lot of memory. So when we use GraalJIT instead, we actually can shrink our um, the amount of memory that the amount of off heap memory that we use here, and that can be a huge advantage. So compilation is compilation is is kind of something that you know, really happens during, mostly during warm-up. I mean, there's, there's a long tail, right? So it's always possible, especially if, if, the use case, if the usage pattern changes during runtime, that some method that wasn't hot towards the beginning of the run might be hot later in the run. And so you always have these kind of sporadic, um, you know, one-off compilations that can happen hours or days or even weeks into the runtime of your application. But generally speaking, JIT compilation is something that really happens during the warm-up phase of your application. For, for a lot of applications, this is within the first half an hour of, of real load being exposed to it. So what it means is that, well, after that, if we don't need that memory anymore, then that memory is just available for our application. So 
like I've said a few times already, um, GraalVM for this use case scenario, for the JIT use case scenario, you can really just replace your JDK with the GraalVM distribution and you're ready to go. So all these things you hear about people saying, well, you know, Graal doesn't support reflection or Graal doesn't support this or Graal doesn't support that. Um, lots of times people are thinking of the AOT use case. And even when they're thinking about the AOT use case, as we'll cover in a few minutes, they're usually wrong um, as AOT supports a lot more than people under, believe it supports today as well. Um, but the deals for the JIT use case, you don't have to modify your application. There's also something called libgrow, which is actually um, a static um, library that's actually compiled by <laughs> the AOT Growl compiler itself, which is kind of cool and meta. Um, and it gives you some of the, it, it basically allows you to use uh, Growl as a pre-compiled uh, version. And this is available in Enterprise Edition. Um, interesting. It's also, as I mentioned, um, the Growl compiler itself um, or is, is already included um, for the AOT use case in the regular JDK as of JDK 9. And so if you're willing to live dangerously, and please do not do this in production, but um, there is a, um, you can add these options to your command line with the regular JDK. Again, um, actually, these options um, are only supported from 10. Um, but you can do this and you can actually use kind of a slightly out of date version of the Growl compiler. Um, but really, if you're gonna use the Growl chat, um, I highly recommend that you use, you actually use the real Growl VM that's gonna have um, the most up-to-date version of, of the compiler code available. So moving on, now we're going to the other main use case, which is AOT ahead of time compilation. This is kind of the more exciting exotic one. So what this does for us is that we, before we, before runtime, before deployment, we AOT compile all the bytecode, okay? And then we're not even running everything on anything on hotspot anymore after we finish building our image um, or our runtime image. Um, we don't, we kind of, you know, forget about hotspot and our runtime becomes this thing called the substrate VM, which is basically like a cut down VM that offers the, the functionality a lot of the functionality that we still need to, to run and be Java, like for example, you know, garbage collection and thread management and things like that, but it doesn't understand bytecode. It can't run bytecode. It doesn't have an interpreter. It doesn't have a JIT compiler. It's just, it's completely ignorant when it comes to Java bytecode. So what this gives you is it gives you much, much, much faster startup time because you literally start executing payload code immediately, much, much smaller footprint and your deliverable is much smaller as well. And we'll actually see that really quickly in a demo in a few slides. So you can think of this as, you know, we're replacing the, the hotspot VM. And so your runtime functionality is, is, is you know, provided by this the substrate VM runtime, and then your AOT compiled code sits on top of that. And as part of that, when we do our image build, what we have to do is we we actually create a, a, an initialized heap that's kind of like a snapshot of of what your application heap is going to look like when it starts when it starts running. So all the class loading and stuff that normally Hotspot does, the substrate VM can't do that. Substrate VM doesn't really know what classes are in a sense. And so we have to do all that class loading and reflection and stuff like that during the beginning, during the image creation phase, you know, before deployment. And then we take a snapshot of the, of the heap. And then that snapshot is used to kind of recreate the, the memory that our AOT compiled code will, will use during the actual runtime. So it sounds all too good to be true. And, and there is of course a catch here. And the catch is that, you know, Java is a dynamic language, right? Like the typing system isn't quite dynamic, like something like JavaScript or whatever, but it's very dynamic in the sense that, you know, during runtime, we can load new classes. We can introduce new classes to the class hierarchy and, and new code. We can even load code like over a network or something and, and pull it into the JVM and JIT compile it and start running it in normal Java. And we can't do that here because again, the substrate VM has no understanding of what bytecode even is. And so we have to work in what's called the closed world assumption where um, all the bytecode that we're gonna run is seen at image build time. And so we identify what that bytecode is, we AOT compile everything that we need and then everything else, all that infra gets thrown away basically. And so that means that we, we have some limits in what we can do. You know, it's not a full real Java implementation 
um, in terms of like complying with the, the Java compatibility kit or anything like that, because there's just a lot of language features that we don't have or can't use if we um, are, are doing our code this way. But it's not as limiting as, limiting as, as you might initially expect. So, um, you know, I mean, for non-trivial applications, like you're not going to go around and just all of a sudden make WebLogic Server, you know, a native application with this tool. Um, you know, like spinning bytecode at runtime is something that's done very often. I mean, think of all the different agents or um, aspect-oriented programming, or you know, it's very, very common for applications and frameworks and pretty much everything to, um, you know, be using a ZOM or whatever and spinning bytecode on the fly, you know, and, and then executing it immediately. So you, you either have to design your application from scratch very often if it's gonna be non-trivial to, to avoid use of those types of technologies. Um, but that's not exactly as hard as it might sound because now we're seeing support from framework makers. And so things like Porcus and, Hiladon and, and Micronaut and, and whatnot actually already have support for Substrate VM where you can use them to make a project that, you know, from the very beginning in your IDE is will run on Substrate. And then you, because you have that known good state, um, any changes you make, if you accidentally do something, introduce some change that breaks um, your support or, or needs, needs additional in order to make it work, um, you'll find that out immediately. So it's much easier to start at a known state that is known to work and then maintain that than it is to take something that, that's huge and monolithic and is probably doing all sorts of stuff that is, is difficult for Substrate VM to support um, from the very beginning. And so um, basically the, but the point is, is that you wanna load all of your, you wanna do all of your class loading during image build time because you won't be able to do it during runtime and you, all that bytecode needs to be found and compiled. We actually have something called the native image agent, which is something that you can use. You, you, use it on the hotspot command line. And it's a JVMTI agent that will go and dynamically identify when the application does things that um, the Substrate VM would, would need help to support. And it can actually um, automatically generate some of the configuration files that you would need so that later when you try and, and make that a native image, um, that the Substrate VM and, and the, the native image framework will have the information it needs to you know, use reflection and to actually load all the classes that it needs to load in order to build a working image for you to use in, 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 uh, on the Substrate VM. And I'm gonna show you the most lame demo in the world because uh, it's gonna, it's literally hello world here. Um, but I do want to, uh, I want to actually demonstrate how amazingly easy this actually is in principle. So I'm hope hopefully everyone here can see my, um, my, my terminal here. And like I said, um, I wasn't feeling horrifically uh, creative here. So um, this is literally just, you know, hello world here. And you can see, um, you know, if you're wondering which Java I'm using here, I'm basically treating my, my Java home is basically just the Growl VM for JDK 8 version um, here. And I'm using it just like a regular JDK here. So I'm gonna say Java C, hello world, and I compile it to get my um, class here. And I'm not even gonna bother running class right now because you know we all know what hello world looks like. So it's really interesting now is I have, there's another tool that ships with, um, you know, in the distribution called native image. And you just a, uh, you, you type a native image and then the name of your, um, your executable. And that's it, just like you're running it. And then you let that go. And, and this does take a little bit of time because what we're doing is we're actually analyzing and doing kind of a points to analysis of the entire application to identify all the classes that are necessary to, to, to run this code and all the byte code that we're gonna need to compile ahead of time compile um, to get into our final um, executable. Now, while this is running, this takes about 90 seconds. I wanna point out another um, kind of technology or advantage here is that um, in, in Enterprise Edition, we actually have something called um, you know, profile um, guided optimization, which um, you can use to actually um, improve the efficiency or the, the, the performance of your resulting binary um, when you make a native image. It's not part of the Community Edition, but it is available in Enterprise Edition. So the, the issue here is that we, we do generate code here that, that's efficient and, and really good and everything, but it's not quite as efficient or optimized as the regular JIT, um, you know, Growl JIT 
use case. And the reason for that is because we're not actually at runtime. We don't have real data that we're interacting with that we can use to profile to actually know how the application code is run. And so because we can't do runtime profiling, um, in a way we don't have a lot of the hints that, that a JIT compiler normally wants to have in order to do the, you know, make the inlining decisions that are really important to make and, and to really understand which chunks of code are hot versus which chunks of code are not hot and things like that. And, you know, branch prediction and all that stuff. So, you know, you really want that runtime profiling data to tell you how to do your JIT compilation or, or AOT compilation, even if, if at all possible. And by default, we don't, we don't get that input into it. So even though my native image here is much smaller, we'll look at what actually, what I generated. Um, so you can see here now I have this executable that was, you know, um, for Hello World, yes, it's big, but you know it's got, it's got the entire substrate VM included in it. Um, but it's uh, you know, but three and a half meg for a Java executable. You know, com compared to that, even using JLink to to trim away you know all the all the fat from from a JRE or a JDK, um, still three and a half megs is is amazingly small. Um, but perhaps more importantly, so let's look at what that actually looks like to execute. So. Here, I, you know, I, I had 10 milliseconds. It probably wasn't, ca things weren't cached. Now I run it, you know, three milliseconds. You know, if I compare that to running Hello World on the JVM, I'm sorry, um, I time it here, you know, we're still in hundreds of milliseconds. So, I mean, we, we have two orders of magnitude faster startup time here. Um, and I didn't have to make any major changes or doing, you know, all I did is just run this, this native image thing against my code. And again, um, that's because this is a trivial application. Um, it, you know, when you're using reflection, you're spinning byte code, all this stuff, it, it gets more complicated. Um, but, it, but that's where using one of these frameworks that supports um, the substrate VM out of the box, like, like Quarkus or whatnot, um, will really give you the, the advantages that, that you need to, to use this in real life and make this practical. So it's really exciting. It's really cool technology um, where you can finally generate these uh, these really quick and, and simple binaries out of your, your Java code. So now let's see if I can. I just, you have uh, less than five minutes left. Yep. Okay. So, um, all right. So moving on, uh, Polyglot, which is the last thing. Um, and this is what allows us to run um, you know, these kind of non Java bytecode languages. You know, obviously, if you're calling, talking about a JVM drop in replacement, running things like, you know, Scala or Groovy or anything else that, that you know, is natively a Java bytecode based language, um, you know, the fact that that's going to work and be super efficient is a no brainer. But the real magic here is that because we have this thing called the Truffle language implementation framework um, that allows us to kind of plug into the Grail compiler and, and, and do things where we're not just interpreting these languages, but we're actually um, we're actually um, JIT compiling them at, at runtime, and it gives us just significant better performance than than earlier implementations. So the stuff that's kind of really you know officially supported and whatnot is we have JavaScript, and we also have all the um, you know the 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 LLVM bit code based technologies like C C and C plus um, plus. So you know, there's a number of languages that are, that are available um, that we provide. There's a number of, of other open source stuff out there that other people have made, like for Lua or whatnot. Um, but for production, we're going to, you know, want people to be sticking with JavaScript um, and or Bitcode um, for, for right now. And I'm going to focus on JavaScript because that's kind of getting a lot of attention right now. Um, people probably noticed, I talked about a little bit on Monday, that in JDK 15, NASHORN was removed. Um, NASHORN we originally replaced something called Rhino, which goes all the way back to the Netscape days, and and you know was kind of the original um, JavaScript on on JDK solution. And NASHORN was great for its time. It was you know, for for language runtimes for dynamically typed languages, but it, it just hasn't had a whole lot of love in in the past ten years. And so um, you can see we're really behind on standard support, and the performance is not as great. So. By using the Grail VM JavaScript implementation, we have full support for you know the, the latest XMA you know 2020 certifications. I think we're like you know like 98% compliant you know for, for EC6, um, which makes us competitive with things like Node. Um, but in the performance is like four to six times faster um, than than NASHORN. 
So I mean, it's an amazing thing's um, performance set. And we can also run Node.js applications right out of the box. I mean, honestly, the only stuff that doesn't really work is there, there's some stuff out there that kind of depends on obscure internal implementation details of, of the V8 um, execution engine and, and some of that stuff won't work. But, you know, really if you have a standard compliant Node.js application, it can work. And we even ship, um, we even ship with the, you know, NPM and NPX, so you can pull down your, your, um, your, um, requirements and, and whatnot, your dependencies and, and, and start running immediately. So you, know, you can usually, you can actually use a GraalVM distribution just as your, your node distribution does and, and start running with it. So again, I wanna draw people's attention to this Venn diagram as, as I send you on your way. Um, so the idea is that if you take any way, thing away from today's talk is that there's two main usage scenarios for Graal. There's AOT, otherwise known as native image, and there's JIT, which is kind of like the standard you know, just in time compilation that you're familiar with from using the regular JDK. And you may or may not want to add support for other languages with that. It's all up to you. So there's many ways to use the technology. You know, the compilation will give you the best peak performance because again, we get that runtime profiling advantage. Um, and there's no limits to what you can do because it's a fully compliant job implementation. AOT gives you the faster startup, smaller footprint, but again, there's some sacrifices that have to be made at least at this point in time in terms of Java compatibility and, um, and some things like maybe you know, really large heaps don't quite work really well for, for AOT at the, at the moment. Um, and there, so there's open source options if you want to go that way, or there's commercial options from Oracle if you're interested in Enterprise Edition. And for a lot of these use cases, all you have to do is just replace Node.js or replace your regular JDK with it and, and give it a shot and see if you get any performance thing. So please just go try it. Um, if you go here to GraalVM, GraalVM.org, this has everything. It's got fantastic documentation. It points you to all the downloads. It's, it's your first stop for getting information and resources for GraalVM. Then the, the Medium blog that the GraalVM team hosts is fantastic. They have lots of updates about the exciting things like, um, you know, LibGraal and, and uh, you know, um, isolate, native isolates and all the neat stuff that they're up to these days. They have really great articles on there regularly. Renaissance Dev, I mentioned it, is the, um, is the benchmarking suite that's kind of modern and, and can show off a lot of things and help you get an idea of, of what the different performance trade-offs might be for different configurations. And if you're going to watch some stuff on YouTube, there's some really great talks out there on YouTube. Um, both of these I, I highly recommend here. Um, that's about like four and a half hours worth of YouTube watching between these two videos, but it's worth it. Sorry. And that's it. Thank you very much for your time. I appreciate everybody that showed up. And if you have any questions, please ask in the, um, there's like that forum thing. And a, uh, I'll check on that, um, you know, kind of on a daily basis for the next two weeks and try and answer questions people have. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Uh, is there any question? You can use Q&A tab to ask your questions. Oh, I will, I will point out since I, I see, it seems we do have uh, uh, two, two people from, from Japan on the call, um, or maybe this dropped, but I will be, uh, I'll be doing the same content on Friday um, in, in Japanese. So that might be a little easier to, to consume for, for some of the audience. Although maybe I should have said that at the beginning of the session as opposed to the end. <laughs> That's great. Wasted 45 minutes of your time, you know, but. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, awesome, awesome. Very good presentation. One of the best I've ever seen. <laughs> and uh, thank you everyone for your participation today. And please do not forget to register to another great sessions in the conference and to interact with the speakers in their playback session page. Please enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Right.